Good morning, church. Great to see you all today. If you're a visitor here, thank you so much for coming and worshiping with us. We're going to begin today with a new song we learned last week called This Is The Day. It comes straight from Psalm 118 that says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Let's begin singing today. the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad. Whether in life or death, whether in joy or 
Church, please be seated. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good. I like it. I like it. <laughs> well, guys, my name is Pastor Tyler. I am the student pastor here at FBC Greenwood, and I just want to welcome you guys this morning. Thank you for coming and joining with us in worship. If you're a visitor this morning, uh, we would love to connect with you as a staff. We'd love to connect with all of our visitors who come, um, but we don't know if you're a visitor if you don't let us know. So there's a couple of ways you can do that. One, you can text uh, your information uh, to the number on the screen, or there is a guest information card in the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and drop that in one of the um, offering boxes on your way out here. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, the only announcement I want to give you guys uh, to be aware of is our Shadow Lake baptism. Uh, that is going to be tonight at Shadow Lake uh, at 6 o'clock tonight. The information is in your bulletin there at the bottom left-hand side. Uh, at this time, though, I would like to uh, do something a little bit special this morning. If you are a teacher, a faculty member, if you are a student, and if you are a parent of a student who's going to school, uh, can you please stand up at this time? Stand up. Please stand up. I'd like to, for Joella Skaggs to come up, and we would like to pray for all of you guys this morning. It's a big day tomorrow, and so... Uh, we just want to lift you all up in prayer as we head into this new school year. Joella? 
Father, we're just so grateful that we get to go back to school tomorrow. That's kind of a, star, a strange request or a, a gratitude, but we are grateful that we are able to go back to school and meet with our friends, meet with new teachers. But Lord, with all of this newness comes some anxiety too. Lord, those little kindergartners starting out and the seniors knowing that this is their last year, Lord, that the decisions and the, the things that are happening in their lives are going to change. But Lord, I ask you that you give us a great year. I ask that you take care of the school board and the administration and the, and the principals as they make decisions that affect all of us, Lord. I pray for all the secretaries and the people up front that just meet every one that comes in, Lord, and makes decisions and makes, thing, makes sure things are taken care of. And I pray for those teachers, Lord, that not only will they meet the educational needs of our kids, but Lord, they'll meet the spiritual and the social and the emotional needs of our kids too. We need your help for this school year. We need it from the bus drivers, from the custodians, from the lunch ladies. We just need you just to put a blessing around every building and let your presence be known that you were there. When it does get tough, that you're going to be there and you're going to take care of us and you're going to answer our prayers. Lord, for every need that we have, thank you for this opportunity to be together and make the 22, 23 year the best that you've ever blessed us with. Amen. Well, church, as we continue to sing this morning, we're going to sing about the mercy that God has poured out on us. And in, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that through his great mercy, he has given us an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. And we have this, this great inheritance, this hope in eternal life because of the work that Jesus did on the cross, that he lived a perfect life in our place. He died taking upon himself our sin and his body, paying the penalty for the wrath that we deserved. And he rose again three days later, conquering sin and death. And, and so we have this great mercy that... He's poured out upon us, and it's our mission then to take the gospel to those around us. As Joella just prayed for this school year, it's our mission to be a light in the darkness. And so as we sing these next couple songs, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper today. Um, as we do these things, let's think about it through the lens of God has poured out his mercy upon us by pouring his wrath on Jesus. But he leaves us here so that we can take the gospel and take that hope to other people. That's our mission. So let's stand, let's sing this next song with that in our mind.
do something a little different this morning with our Lord's Supper. Typically, we uh, partake of the Lord's Supper later on in the service. But this morning, we planned it to, to be right after this song that we've just sung. If you notice how many times the word mercy was used in this song, we hear of mercy, a lot of times we, we associate it with grace, grace and mercy. And the two words really uh, have similar meanings, but they are different. If you're talking about grace, we understand that grace is a gift that we receive that we didn't earn. We know that from salvation, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's a gift. You didn't have to work for it. You didn't have to earn it. It's grace. It's free. You received it. Mercy, now get this, mercy is not receiving what we did deserve. Think about that for a minute. Grace is receiving something that you didn't deserve. Mercy is not receiving something that you did deserve. The Lord's Supper is a picture of mercy. When we think of the Lord's Supper, it reminds us of what Jesus did on the cross. He took the punishment we deserved. We deserve that punishment, and yet he took our place. We didn't get what we deserved. That's mercy. Jesus took that for us. In just a minute, I'm going to invite you to come to one of these stations and get one of these little cups. It has a cracker on one side, a juice on the other. And this morning, in doing this, we're going to take the Lord's Supper individually. In other words, we're not going to do it all at one time. When you come up here and get one of these cups, you can either stay here at the altar and take the Lord's Supper right here. You can go back to your seat and maybe do it Individually, you can maybe do it as a couple or a family. But we just want to give you the freedom to let the Lord's Supper be as meaningful to you this morning as it possibly can. The Bible tells us that we're to examine ourselves, that we're not to just jump into the Lord's Supper, that we're to, first of all, make sure we understand what it means and then make sure our heart is ready to worship the Lord. Maybe this morning you just need to spend some time with God. Maybe before you even come to a station, you just want to stop and pray. We're going to just have this kind of a silent time where you just do what God leads you to do. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to invite you to come to one of these stations and you will have freedom to partake the Lord's Supper. Now, who takes this? Well, the Lord's Supper is a symbol of what Jesus did when he died on the cross. And so in taking this, you're saying, this is my testimony. This is what I've done in accepting and believing Jesus. And so if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, we invite you as a part of the body of Christ to come and partake of this Lord's Supper together with us. Well, let me pray, and then you're free to come and and worship the Lord by remembering what he did for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the worship we've experienced. Thank you for this song that we just finished singing that has reminded us of your great mercy. Knowing that we didn't receive something that we deserved to receive, and that was punishment death, and that Jesus, you died on the cross, taking our place. So Lord, thank you for this little cracker that would symbolize your body that was sacrificed on the cross for us. Thank you for this little cup of juice that symbolizes your blood that was shed for us, that we might have forgiveness of our sins and a relationship with you. So, Lord, may our hearts be ready, and may this be an act of worship and gratitude to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to come and share.
hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thy all in What a great morning of, of worship and just experiencing God's presence. I, I, I don't know about you, but one of the blessings of, of worshiping together corporately is, is just sensing God's Spirit. And, you know, when I grew up, the Holy Spirit was hardly ever mentioned. I, I knew that there was a, a Holy Spirit because the Bible talked about it occasionally, but I didn't understand it and know who it was. I thought maybe it was more of an emotion, something you just had a feeling that came over you. But I pray that this morning that you have sensed his presence in your heart. The Bible talks about when we take the Lord's Supper, we experience his, his presence in a, in, a, in a different way as we actually take that piece of cracker and drink that little cup of juice. So I hope that that's been, uh, been your experience this morning. Several years ago, my, uh, my wife and I were at home at Christmas, and we went to visit my sister. She has a house up in the mountains in North Carolina, and in fact, it's in West Jefferson, North Carolina, a little bitty mountain town. And that afternoon, we went into town, and we visited a cheese factory. There's a place where they were making cheese. And, and we walked in, and they had all these samples there that you could try. Every cheese that they were making you could taste that cheese and, and sample it. We also went into a little store there in West Jefferson that was making fudge. And same thing. that had all these samples that you could taste, all the different kinds of fudge that they were making. I don't know if you've ever been to Sam's, but you go to Sam's and they got these little tables around where you can sample something that they're trying to sell. Just free samples. Now, why do businesses do that? Why do they give out free samples like that? It's pretty simple. They want to sell the product. 
They want you to taste it so that you'll buy it. Well, now, why is that so effective? Why is that method used in a lot of ways in businesses? Two reasons. One, it's free. It's free. You go to some place and they're giving out something that's free, everybody wants a part of it. I, 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 I've been to Sam's before. When they first started doing this years ago at Sam's, they give out these free things and, and people get back in line again. They finally had to say, no, you only get it one time. We just like free things. We, if somebody's given us something, we don't have to pay for it. I mean, just imagine, you go into a store and they're giving samples, but yet you have to pay for those samples. Probably not going to try it. It's free. Well, the second reason is you get to experience it. In other words, you get to taste what you're about to buy or want to buy. You, you get to taste it. You get to see. I remember going in that cheese factory and and tried for the first time in my life cheese curds some of you look at me like, what did he say he said curds yeah cheese i didn't know what cheese curd was and i remember trying it and we bought a big old bag of it it was that good you taste something you you, you understand how good it is you buy it well you're saying where are you going with this well we're talking this morning about the gospel we're talking about being together for the gospel, and specifically this morning, about sharing the gospel. And when you think about the gospel, hopefully those two things come up. One, it's free. The whole message is built around grace. You receive something you didn't pay for. It's free. Salvation is not something you earn. You don't work your way to heaven. You can't earn it. It is free. So when we talk about the gospel, that should be the quick thing that comes to your mind. It's a message about grace. It's a message about receiving something we didn't pay for. But the second about the gospel message is that you get to experience. When you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you experience what it's like to be forgiven of your sins. You, you experience what it's like to have peace, to have joy, to have a, a relationship with with a holy God, you experience that. That's what makes the gospel message that we share so special. It's a message that's based on a free gift that was given to us when Jesus died on the cross. And it's a message that will change your life when you receive Christ into your life as your Savior. Now, we're talking this morning about gospel conversations. Now, let me, let me just stop there. Because if you're not a Christian, you've never accepted Christ, you're here on a great Sunday morning. First of all, we took the Lord's Supper together. You got to, you got to hear the heart of the Christian message in a, in a way that we actually participate in. And taking that little cracker and drinking that little cup of juice, we celebrate our salvation. And then coming on a day that we're talking about sharing our faith. What is the gospel? How to share the gospel with others. I pray that you're sitting here this morning and you're going to hear God speak to your heart if he's not already. And in doing so, that your heart will be open to receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, if you're a Christian, it's a great Sunday morning to learn, to have some some things that hopefully will equip you. And I'll just be honest at this point. I struggle as a pastor because there's times I don't think I have done what I have supposed to do as a pastor in equipping you. You come in here and you hear us say, hey, go out and share the gospel. And maybe you walk out of here going, okay, how do I do that? What do I say? How do I, how do I share the gospel with somebody? Well, I'm excited about this morning. Because this morning's message is going to be heavy on application. It's going to be more of a practical how-to message. How do you have a gospel conversation with somebody? How do you do that? So let me pray, and we'll, uh, we'll look at God's Word together. Lord, I do want to thank you for the worship we've experienced. Just the celebration of, of who you are and what you did for us. Again, Lord, I thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. And Lord, if there is someone here that has never experienced, never, never been told that salvation is free, 
maybe thinking they've had to earn it or be good enough. Lord, may this morning they hear a message of good news, that the gospel is built around grace of what you did for us and giving it and offering it to us as a gift. And Lord, thank you that we can experience it. We can know what it's like to be forgiven of our sins and be given the hope of an eternal home in heaven with you. So Lord, do your work in all of us here this morning. May we leave different than when we came in. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You got your Bible, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Here's where I want to start this morning. If you're going to share the gospel, if you're going to have a gospel conversation with someone, you need to know what the gospel is. The Bible gives us that. We're going to talk about that. We're wearing these shirts that says together for the gospel. And we said last week, we'll continue to say it. The word gospel is the key. So here's what the gospel is according to what the Bible says. Look at verse 1, chapter 15. Paul says this, he's writing to the church in Corinth. He says, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. Now, that good news is just the gospel. That's what good news means, is gospel. That's what gospel means, is good news. Look what he says. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. Now, that's an important statement because it's helping us to know when you receive the gospel... Jesus took a hold of you, and he said, I'm not letting go. If you're a Christian this morning, you are held by God. Now, you might struggle, and you might look at your life and say, man, there's been times I've kind of fallen away. Let me tell you what. Jesus promised he would never let go of you. He would never let go. You can say, man, I'm just trying to hold on as a Christian. (laughs) You need to look at it differently. You need to say, you know what? Thank God I'm being held. As a Christian, God's holding me and he won't let go. Now, look what he says here. Verse 2, it is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Now, that's important because there are people that say in their life that they once accepted Christ, but now they don't believe anymore. Did they lose their salvation? No, they never had it. Because once you have been saved... God takes a hold of you, and he won't let go. And so your perseverance, your your holding on, your continuing in the faith is not because of your effort and work. It's because God's holding you. That's what Paul is saying here. It's this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. Now, he's talking about never true in your life in the first place. The gospel is true. It's not that he was doubting or putting doubt about the gospel. He was saying, maybe it wasn't true to begin with in your life. Maybe you never truly trusted Jesus. That's, again, what it, what it means when we take the Lord's Supper. We come back and we affirm again what Jesus did for me. I can't erase that. I can't, I can't denounce that because he came into my heart and forgave me of my sins. Look at verse 3. Here's where Paul gets into the gospel. I passed on to you what was most important and what has been passed on to me. Here it is. Here's the gospel. Christ died for our sins just as the Scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the Scripture said. Now that's the the gospel heart. First, Jesus came to this earth and died on the cross for our sin. Now we understand He died for our sin. The Bible says that. That means he didn't die for his sin. He wasn't punished for his sin. He was punished for our sins. He died on a cross for our sins. He took our place. And then the Bible says he was buried and he rose from the grave. That means that that when he came up out of the grave, he verified he was God. He wasn't just a man that had kind of some bad luck, and he got put on a cross and was crucified and buried in the tomb, and there's where he is. No, he rose from the grave. He was buried because he was dead. He had died in our place, and he rose from the grave, signifying that he was God and that God had accepted his sacrifice. That's the gospel. So here's the question. 
How do you turn an ordinary conversation into a gospel conversation? How do you, how do you take a conversation, and we have lots of them, you just think about how many conversations you have in a typical day, quite a few. How do you take that conversation and turn it, transition it, move it into a conversation about the gospel? Because when you think about it, the gospel was meant to be shared in that conversation. You can, you can proclaim it and preach it, but the Great Commission says, go and make disciples. And it literally says, as you're going. In other words, as you're meeting people, as you're talking to people, as you're, you're associating with people, share the gospel. How do you turn that ordinary conversation into a gospel conversation? Now, let me tell you what a gospel conversation is. So you get the term when you hear that. What does it mean to have a gospel conversation? First thing, a conversation is two-way. In other words, you're talking to somebody. A gospel conversation is not you preaching to somebody. It's not you lecturing somebody. It's in a conversation where there's listening and talking. But it's motivated. Get this. It's motivated by love. Now, let me, let me back up. A gospel conversation is a, is a conversation mostly in the context of a relationship. Not always. You can have a conversation with a stranger, somebody you've never met, somebody you don't know. You can have a gospel conversation with them. But the most effective is when you have a relationship, maybe even if it's just surfacy, you know their name, you've talked to them, they know you. So a gospel conversation is a two-way conversation in the context of a relationship mostly, and it's motivated by love of God and love of others. In other words, listen to me. A gospel conversation is not a project for you. I would, I would shudder to feel that you walked out of here this morning and you did this as, an, as a project or an assignment. You went and found somebody and had this gospel conversation and you treated it as they are your project. It is not. In fact, the motivation for a gospel conversation always has to begin with your love for God. It's not out of duty, even though it's a, a command. It's a part of the commission that we've been given. But it still has to come out of your heart of your love to obey Christ to do what he's asked you to do. You, you, you share Christ, you share the gospel in any other way, and I'm, I'm telling you, people can see through that. They can see that you're not genuine. You're not authentic. You're not real. You're just doing this because you feel obligated. You're motivated out of love for God, and here's, here's the second. You're motivated out of a love for people. Here's where, here's where I got nailed this week and just getting ready for this message, is hearing this question, Ronnie, do you really love people that are not Christians? I mean, you really care about somebody that's if they died, would spend eternity in hell? I have a, a list of people I pray for, and I come back to that list and praying for them, but I look at it and say, do I really love these people on this list? Do I really care about these people? Because having a gospel conversation is motivated by love, for God and love for others. Love for those people that you're witnessing to. How do you do it? Four steps there in your bulletin. Step number one, pray. Pray. Now, that's not just a church word that you throw out and say, okay, we pray, we get it. No, it's saying, I can't do this, God. Some of you are sitting here and you're already, you're like gospel conversations, witnessing, ha, huh, you're scared. I mean, you're like, I don't know. You got all these reasons. Put it in the hands of the Lord. Just say, God, I'm honest with you. I'm scared. I don't know. I don't, I'm not real comfortable with this. I'm not a people person. I have a hard time talking to people. Here's the prayer. Lord, I need your help. That's what it means to pray. Pray for those opportunities. Pray Pray that God will give you the strength. And, and in praying for you, you pray for that person. At the end of the service this morning, and you can drop down, look in your notes, there's a couple lines there that I'm going to challenge you to write the names of someone or people that you know are not Christians. And that you would make a commitment this morning to pray and ask God to give you an opportunity to share the gospel with. 
You be thinking about that because I'm going to challenge you with that. But that's where it begins, prayer. Second thing, and, and this is important, listen. Listen for those opportunities. Again, it needs to be natural. It doesn't need to, to be like this person has been ambushed by you or this person, you just kind of came on them and, and started talking to them about the Lord. Now, you can do that. I mean, if that's a, an opportunity you have, which I think is, is rare, but it might be, the best, though, is coming out of a natural conversation where you're listening to this person. You're asking the Lord to help you to, to, to find that opportunity that's there, that bridge that you can now begin to take the conversation to a conversation about Christ. Lots of different ways to do that. One of the best ways is to ask questions. Just when you're talking to somebody, just, just ask questions and listen to what they say. Or pick up on things that they say. Listen, you won't meet someone that probably has never had a problem in their life. In fact, you probably this week will talk to somebody that's in a crisis. Somebody that's had somebody in their life that they know has died. Maybe have been diagnosed with cancer. Maybe lost a job. Maybe has some kind of crisis in their home. You're going to encounter somebody this week that's got a major problem going on in their life. Those are great opportunities to take that conversation, to transition from, from where they are to now being able to talk to them about the Lord. I, I was thinking this week, I've had, I've had probably, a, I don't know, half a dozen guys that I've talked to this past week about the Razorbacks. Just want to talk football. They're going to open their season up in a couple weeks. You know, what do you think about the Razorbacks? What do you think they're going to do this year? Da, 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 da. I mean, it's just a natural conversation. And I thought, as I was getting ready for this, I thought, how many opportunities that I had in those simple conversations that I had with some guys to be able to just kind of talk about the Razorbacks, okay, we're on common ground here, we're going back and forth, but to just somewhere in there go, you know what, I was wondering, yeah, I, I, I wonder if Sam Pittman's a Christian. You ever thought of that? You ever you ever ask yourself that question? I mean, you know, you see him on TV, you hear him talk, you know, the players love him, he's a successful coach. I wonder if he's saved. What do you think? All you've done is shifted the conversation off of winning and losing and what kind of season to now. I think Sam Pittman's going to heaven? I think he's a Christian? I think he's given his life to Christ? Listen to what they say. And you turn that conversation. That's what it means to listen for opportunities. Now, third, you write this down, and this is the heart of this, share the gospel. Listen, having a gospel conversation means the gospel is a part of the conversation. Not just being nice to somebody, not just listening, not just serving and helping people, being kind to people. Those are good things. Those are things that build a relationship, but the point is you want that opportunity to share with them the good news. They're not going to heaven just because you were nice to them, okay? Nobody's going to get to heaven and go, well, I'm in heaven because, you know, this person uh, showed a lot of kindness to me. I, I was thinking years ago, we, uh, we were partnering with uh, a mission in Nicaragua. We were sending teams over there, and, and really the, the biggest assignment that we had, I know for the team I went with, was to feed the kids over there, I mean, they were, we were in a real, real poor area where these kids didn't have food. And so two times a day, we were helping to serve food. And, and we did, and it was an awesome experience, just loving on these kids. But you know what? Not a single one of those kids are going to go to heaven because we serve food to them. They're going to go to heaven because somebody shared the gospel with them. Now, hopefully... That kindness as we were over there helping them and feeding them, maybe opened the doors or maybe, you know, got them to see how much God loved them and would provide for them. But at some point, somebody had to have a gospel conversation. Somebody somewhere had to tell those boys and girls the good news of Jesus Christ. Share the gospel. Now, here's, here again is where I'm, I'm under conviction. How many of you in here could share the gospel with someone. Don't raise your hand. Just think. I, I hope that there's a lot of you here goes, I, I, got, I can do that. I got confidence. I, I know how. But I think there's probably 
a good group in here that are like, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I could, you know, I'm, maybe I'd say the wrong thing, or I, you know, I, I just don't know. I want you to know. I want you to watch this video. I got a short video that's a simple presentation of the gospel, and it's all it is. It's just a, a gospel presentation. When you get to that point in a conversation where you've transitioned, and now the door's open, and you have a chance to share somebody the gospel, listen to this simple presentation, and uh, See if you learn something. Guys? Hey, it's Jimmy Scroggins again, working on our Gospel Conversations training. And I want to give you an example that you can maybe follow as you try to get ready to get reps to share the Gospel of Jesus. So I'm going to show you the three circles, just the Gospel piece right now on the board. The Bible tells us that God has a design for our lives, that God cares about every aspect of our lives. That's our families, that's our personal lives, that's our choices, our money, our sex life. Really everything about our life, God has a design for it. If we live according to God's design, then we have the opportunity to live in the arena of God's blessing. The problem is that all of us have a tendency to depart from God's design. When we depart from God's design, the Bible has a word for that, and the word is sin. And inevitably, when we sin against God, when we leave His design, we end up in a place that we call brokenness. Now, all of us know what brokenness feels like. It feels like emptiness. It feels like guilt. It feels like rejection, it feels like shame, it feels like regret. But when we get in this place of brokenness, we always try to fix it. So we try to maybe dive into a different relationship or try to make more money or try to become more religious. But whatever we do, we try to mitigate the pain of our brokenness. We try to escape our brokenness in some way. Now, brokenness really hurts and it feels like a terrible thing. But the truth is it's a good thing because brokenness draws our attention to the need for change in our lives. But the change that we need doesn't come from in here. The change we need comes from somewhere else. The good news is that the Bible tells us where that kind of change comes from. That kind of change comes from what's called the good news or the story of the gospel. Gospel is just the Bible word that means good news. The gospel is the story of Jesus. Jesus, who is the Son of God, who came to earth and he never departed from God's design in any way, not even one time. But Jesus was crucified on the cross for, the Bible says, the sins of the world. That's my sins and your sins. And when Jesus was hanging on the cross, God did a miracle. He took the sins of the world, our sins, and put them on Jesus. And Jesus received the punishment from God for our sins. When he'd done everything that he came to do, he said, it is finished, and he died. They took his body off the cross, they buried him, and three days later, Jesus was raised from the dead. The Bible says that God raised him from the dead to prove that Jesus was who he said he was, the Son of God, and that he could do what he came to do, forgive our sins and heal the broken places in our lives. The kind of change we need doesn't come from in here. The kind of change we need comes from the gospel itself. The Bible says that what we need to do when we find ourselves in brokenness is repent of our sins. In other words, change our heart, change our mind, change our direction, and believe the gospel story. That's the story of Jesus, how he was crucified for our sins and raised from the dead. The Bible says if we'll repent and believe, then Jesus will come into our lives. He'll forgive our sins and begin to heal the broken places in our lives. And then the Bible says that God will give us the opportunity to recover and pursue God's design for our lives. The cool thing about this is that we get to recover and pursue God's design from wherever we are. We don't have to turn back the past. We get to go and believe God and walk with God from right here. Now this is just the gospel piece. There's other things that you need to learn and other things that you need to rep, but I hope that this will help you as you learn to share the gospel of Jesus, turning everyday conversations into gospel conversations. Yeah, insert in your bulletin is, is that diagram right there. Now again, you watch that, he's on a board, he's drawing, Chances are you might not have that opportunity to, to take something and draw it and graphically show them. 
But hopefully you can see how simple a, a word picture is, just helping people to, to understand what's happened in our life. God's design, he created us in his image. We were created to have a relationship with him. But then sin, you got the separation, and you've got that brokenness that results from that. And let me just tell you something. You will not meet anyone, anyone, that hasn't experienced brokenness. Because we're all sinners. We all have sinned. And so there's, there's some brokenness in all of us. We've all experienced. You can relate, and the person you're talking to can relate to brokenness. And as you, as you highlight that brokenness and identify that brokenness and, and see maybe the different ways that people have tried to fix it. I love the little errors that he did. You know, some people try to fix it with, you know, a better job, more money, a, a bigger house, you know, a, a better relationship. Maybe even church. People say, hey, I'm going to try coming to church. Maybe that'll work. There's only one thing can fix that brokenness, and that is Jesus Christ. And that's entailed in the message of the gospel. And so it takes you to that last link of, of being able to share with them the good news. I've got good news for you about brokenness. Jesus came to fix that. That brokenness is sin in your life, sin that we all have to deal with. And Jesus came to die on a cross for that sin. And he rose from the grave, which helps me to know he's alive and he's real. And, and so all of that diagram does is just get in your mind how I'm going to communicate, how I'm going to have in a conversation a presentation of the gospel. Now, that can't be canned. You don't, you don't learn a presentation and when you get to that point, you know, just kind of start reciting things. It needs to come to your heart. And let me tell you what. Every conversation you have with somebody is going to be different. We're all different. You're going to talk to people, and, and it's going to be different situations, different problems, different, different backgrounds. And so you take the gospel message in you, and you fit it into that conversation where the message of the gospel, the truth of what the Bible says, is what they hear. Now, let me challenge you with something before we get off of this point. I want to encourage you to practice sharing the gospel. I don't know if I've ever at, just challenged you to do that. Practice. Practice. Practice on your, your spouse. Practice with somebody you know at work that's a Christian. Just say, you know what? I want to get better at sharing my faith. I want to get better at sharing the gospel. And I, I just want to, I want to learn how to, to say it and share it with somebody better. I mean, practice is just a, a normal part of learning. I, my wife and I, Friday night, was watching the movie The Pistol. It's the story of Pete Maravich. It's way back, years and years ago. Some of you don't even know who Pete Maravich is. One of the best, greatest basketball players that ever played. And, and it talked about in this, in this movie, and even at the end, the hours and hours and hours of practice he put into this game. And if you've, if you've ever heard Michael Jordan's story, I mean, one of the greatest basketball players to ever live, too. Natural ability, just great talent. You ever heard him talk about how many hours and hours he practices? Tiger Woods, probably the greatest golfer that ever lived. Just incredible, amazing talent. The man practiced hours and hours and hours. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's out of line for me this morning to say, Practice sharing the gospel, just learning how to, to say it and share it and, and get it in your mind where it just flows. It's not, a, it's not a, a struggle to talk through it. Now, again, yes, the Holy Spirit's speaking through you, and it's got to be real from your heart. But just knowing how to share that, feeling confident that you know the Scriptures, you know what it means to, 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 to explain to somebody why Jesus had to die. What, what the resurrection means. What does it mean when the Bible says he rose from the dead? How important is that? Share the gospel. Here's the fourth. And, and listen, you, you, you can't leave this out. Once you share the gospel, the gospel demands a response. That means invite the person you're talking to to respond. If you've had that gospel presentation, you've, you've been able to share with him the gospel you don't get to the end and go, ha, good. How'd you like that? No, <laughs> it demands a response. In other words, asking them, is there, is there 
anything that would keep you from trusting Christ. Or maybe, maybe you're not there. Maybe it's just, hey, has that ever happened to you? Have, have you ever trusted Jesus as your Savior? Maybe you're talking to somebody that's a, that, that tells you in that course that they are a Christian. And man, what a great way just to em, encourage them and remind them about the gospel. When you look at the Bible and you study in Acts, Paul went to Athens. And the Bible records him sharing the gospel with the council there in the city of Athens. And, and he shared the gospel. And the Bible says there were three responses that Paul got. And, and I, I believe they're the same three that you and I get. Paul had shared the gospel, and the Bible says that the people laughed at him. Just laughed at him. It's Paul, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. I, I, can I just tell you, there's going to be people who don't want to hear what you have to say. They just don't. They don't believe in God. Maybe they're angry at God. They don't want to hear what you have to say. They've been turned off from church. Whatever reason, but they just might flat reject what you've said. Now, what do you do with that? Well, again, remember who you're talking to. You're talking to somebody that has experienced brokenness or will experience brokenness. So now that they've heard the good news of what to do with that brokenness, you tell them, hey, listen, if I can help you, if there's any time in your life that, that I can help you or pray for you, contact me. Let me know. Just thank them for letting you share the gospel with them and then offering yourself in some kind of follow-up. Maybe somewhere later, when their world crashes, they're going to remember what you said, and they'll come back to that gospel message. Second response Paul got was this. There were some that just laughed. There were some, the Bible says, that said, Hey, Paul, i got some questions. This has interest me. This has got me thinking. Let's get together. So I, Paul took that and, and met with them again. And so there might be some people that, that you know didn't reject you, but they're not ready to accept Christ. They're thinking about it. God's working in their heart. They're asking questions. And, and, and that's a great opportunity for you to follow up. Get them in a Bible study. Get them a Bible to read. You know, invite them to, to a, a study, or you just take them one-on-one and just look in the Gospel of John. I mean, that's, a, that's a, a, an invitation that you're giving them to walk with them. The third response that Paul got, and you can read it in Acts 17, is that uh, there were people that believed. They were ready. They heard Paul talk about the gospel, and the Bible says they believed. It, there might be an opportunity you have, and I pray that you'll have it, to where you get to lead somebody to Christ. Many of you probably sitting here this morning have never had that opportunity. I would love to have those of you that have to come up and share because I know what it did in my life, the very first person I ever led to the Lord. And, and when I have led people to the Lord past that, there is nothing like it. There is no other experience in the Christian life than knowing that God used you to bring spiritual life to a person. You didn't save them, but you were the messenger. Some of you are, are, are maybe going to have that opportunity. So, so what do you do? You, you invite them. You've got, to, you've got to lead them to that. So if they're ready, you pray. The Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord. So if they're ready to be saved, the Bible says all they got to do is call upon the name of the Lord, which is a part of the repentance. I mean, if they've heard the gospel and know that to receive Christ, you must repent and believe. They're ready to repent and believe. So what's their next step? What's the response to the invitation? Call upon the name of the Lord. Maybe somebody did that with you. Maybe that's somebody had a prayer that they said, hey, pray this prayer. You can't pray a sinner's prayer for somebody. It's got to be a decision they make. You can help them with the prayer. You can help them to know what to say, but it's their heart. I mean, think about the thief on the cross. He didn't say some long sinner's prayer. This is what he said. Hey, Jesus, remember me. When you go into paradise today, when you die, don't forget me. That's all he said, but his heart had changed. And so maybe that's the response that you're helping somebody to, to get to is to just call upon the Lord. Just reach out to him. Now, I told you that I want to close with challenging you 
to write the names of somebody, maybe several people, maybe just one, that's not a Christian. And you might be sitting there going, I, I don't know anybody personally. I, I mean, all my friends are Christians. Have you had a conversation with all the people you know then, if they're saved? I've had many, many times where I've sat with a family or people that have known somebody has passed away, and I'll say, hey, were they a Christian? Well, I think so. I, I never really asked them. So having a conversation with someone might just be having a gospel conversation to help make sure that they know the gospel. Maybe there's somebody you're not sure of. Write their name down. Now, some of you, you know some people. You work beside people, go to school with some people. You got somebody that God has put on your heart. Can I just tell you, God's working in that person. Or your mind would have never went to that name. God put that name in your heart. Now, Satan's going to do everything he can to keep you from writing his name down or her name down. You got to follow through. I encourage you and challenge you. Write the name down. Make a commitment this morning. Walk out of here with your bulletin with a name or several names that you're going to commit to pray for to have a gospel conversation. Warning, you're going to enter a battle. If that person is lost, Satan wants to keep him there. He belongs to Satan. Now, if you're going to have a gospel conversation, you better pray. You better, when you have that conversation, be ready, listen, look for those opportunities, and be ready to share the gospel. And if you do get that opportunity, invite them to respond. Amen? That's kind of weak, but we'll close with that. Let's pray. Your head bowed. Lord, I, I, I just ask you as people are praying, that Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, someone that's never trusted you as their Savior, never experienced grace, they don't know what it's like to have salvation given as a gift. They've never experienced forgiveness. They've never tasted to see how good the Lord is. Lord, I pray that they'll do that this morning. If you're sitting here and you've never trusted Jesus, I invite you to pray this prayer. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for taking the punishment that I deserve. Come into my heart right now. Forgive me of my sins. I put my trust in you and you alone. If you prayed that prayer, friend, and it was from your heart, Jesus now lives in you. And that's the miracle of salvation, that he, he takes a, a person that was lost and dying and now has life in them. If you're already a Christian, and you wrote some names down on that paper, would you right now just pray, Lord, help me to have a gospel conversation with this person or these people. Give me courage and boldness. Give me the love that I need for them. Help me to have that conversation with them. Lord, do your work here as we close this service. Lord, may we be committed to walk out of here ready to live for you and to fulfill the mission that you've given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tyler and I will be down front here at the close. And uh, at the end of this service, if you need someone to pray with, talk to, if we can help you in any way, please come and see us. Uh, maybe this next week, there's things on your heart that we can help you with. Uh, please reach out to us. We're going to close with this song. It's one of my favorite hymns, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and then these next words I love, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's how we'll close this morning. So let's stand as we sing.
soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace his word shall not fail you Let's go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. You're dismissed.